Now, I am of the mind that I would rather hear bits and bobs and paper shuffles and uh, everything short of children screaming their full head off at length. I say this because I have a four-year-old, so she may make some noise. Uh, rather than crickets. Um, so if we are not too many and you guys want to have your mic or say things occasionally, you either hold down your space bar and you can say something, um, just so I don't feel like I'm talking to an empty room, which is kind of what I'm in. Quick, everyone mute your computers. <laughs> I, I will say, though, I mean, you may be alone in that room, but I, I, I've been down there. It's not an empty room by any stretch of <laughs> Please hold. Let's see. Let me get a bit of length. Not jinx this. All right. A very shabby shop tour. Okay, so you can see the kegerator, a heap of looms, um, equipment, rhodium plating station, a laser printer, which is a fine bit of something to have. An excess of overhead shelving and never enough clear containers. Cleaning station, buffing station. Uh, kiln on top of kiln, because that's how we do. Um, my very high-tech ventilation. Uh, torch is in the milk crate underneath. You probably can't see it for the vice. Soldering station in the corner. Centrifugal caster. Blessed rolling mill. Uh, vacuum plant casting machine I have a love-hate relationship with, and my very new, uh, seriously, I've been a metalsmith this long, I have my own bench grinder as of two weeks ago. Uh, as compared to the hand crank one, I will show you beside it, and behind that is lapidary gear, and uh, then more workspace. There is the very fast shop tour. All right, it's and we got beautiful. the full host of everybody. How many lovely humans do we have with us? Humans. Twelve. I don't know about humans. It's Glugius, eleven guests. All right. Oh, Dietrich, who asked me who was in my class last time, now is the time for you to take a screen grab of who's here. <laughs> and, and done. Thank you. All right. I am going to share my screen. We're going to do a couple of sort of slideshows where I talk you through all the steps. I have one very short video at the end, but when I tried to juggle camera and doing of things, I realized that photographs were clearer and uh, then we can pause and chat things up as we go along. So I'm gonna screen share off my laptop. Mm. We'll start with, yeah, this one. So, let me full screen this. Really, I can. All right, so everyone, it's probably not the first one. Of course, I'm halfway through this. Don't mind me, we're reversing in time very quickly. All right, stop the screen share because I'm way in the middle of that. Get you back to the real grind and the entire grind and the part that is the slowest and longest and possibly the most annoying part of doing coin die making is die prep. Uh, so. There we go. Okay, I got to the beginning now. Try this again. Do. Share. Do. Full screen. Okay, so you should see a whole bunch of dyes. And we do. Good. Lovely. All right. Um, I've got better pictures of them. I will remember which way to go eventually. Uh, this is one we did at our first Moneyers workshop at Fool 
three years ago, I think, uh, for Baldrick and Brela. Uh, Dietrich and I both took a team of people and had them do dives. And they got them done in, what was it, two hours or so, Dietrich? Something like that. Something like that. I mean, it was two years ago, I, you know, that, that sort of detail. <laughs> yep. No, no, no. Just, I'm like, it's just ish. Yeah. All right. So the first dives I did were these ones for Edward and Ryland uh, for what we'll see on the project. Um, so we've got uh, Jorvik Penny here. And I think this was. Newt. And this one is a Moneyers, uh, sort of my version of an Eboa Moneyers mark. And it just goes O R L A in reverse around the edge. Uh, Eldamirians will recognize these guys. So about four more to do, and I'll have a full set. Uh, in in case there are any amongst us who aren't Eldamirians, would you, you may want to explain. Yeah, give a shout out. Are. Okay. Uh, sorry, our uh, our badges for our orders and our AOAs. So our AOAs are Maiden's Heart, uh, Orion, and Scarlet Banner for Arts and Science. Sorry, um, Service Arts and Science and Marshalling, uh, Marshal Activities. Uh, and above them are the Wayne, again for Service. Crucible for mid-level arts and science, and Thorbjorn and Tamer for mid-level martial activities. Uh, here are what I did last winter for a copy of one of the Hedeby coins. We'll go more into that one uh, in a slideshow. This is uh, my copy. I say my copy because my name gets put into it, but otherwise it's a decent copy of uh, silk beards, uh, some of the first silver money minted in Ireland uh, around, I'll say 1060. I'm bad with numbers. Um, and it's a delight because it is, so I made a copy of a coin that was made in Ireland that was a copy of the coin that was made in England. Um, so copying money, uh, period. A couple other random commissions weird things you can use dyes for. Um, we made uh, tokens for friends of our Shire recently. Uh, so I tried a one inch one and that went reasonably well. Okay, you start with a giant chunk of steel. Giant, how giant? Uh, typically one inch uh, is what we standardized to. And so one inch in diameter, you guys can see my pointer, right? Yes. Uh, and then in this case, I stepped down to four inches in length. I used to do five inches. Uh, it seemed excessive, and I am frugal, so there we are. This is what you start with. It takes a lot of filing and sanding to prep it into something that you want to strike money with. Um, showing here, you will hope, some people will find places where you can buy the steel, uh, 1018 steel. I get it from metal supermarkets here in Ontario. And it looks more or less the way you show it. You can see that they're using some sort of machine uh, to slice the rod, basically. Uh, so we get these weird shapes here. And, would be basically a bit power bandsaw. Okay. Uh, with these half crescenty shapes, I assumed it was something applying force. This weird uh, shape. That's really uh, consistent in all of their cuts. It's an artifact of some harmonics going through the blade. Okay, All right. It's, it's... Um, so if they've done a good job for you, whoop, it's relatively square. <laughs> if it is not, you have to address that initially. My guys, they cut them relatively square. Uh, they don't make too much extra work for me. Very, very sharp bits like this is why the very first thing I do um, when I'm about to work on them is I cut a bevel, top and bottom, taking off all those nasty uh, little flaky bits, burrs, and things that will otherwise slice the heck out of my hands if I do not deal with them first. Um, so just a little, this is maybe one millimeter, and a sort of medium coarse file um, around each edge. So you're going to work on the top, and we've got to get down to a nice flat surface. We're going to file all the way through all the, <clears throat> we're going to file through all of this sort of low area in the center here. 
this eye-shaped center filing. So right now I'm just filing in one direction mostly um, and trying to keep it level. As I get a more consistent edge all the way around, I start to cross cut in different directions. So I'll run the file this way across the whole piece a number of times. Then I will turn the piece typically against my bench pin, which is this uh, V-shaped chunk of wood because it gives me something to hold it nice and firmly against. So I will go in different directions and around the piece, uh, trying to stay as flat as I can because I don't want <clears throat> a, a, a lump in the center because uh, that will make weird and concave dots. Um, working through it. Uh, things to note, everybody wants to do this when they're holding their files. So you want the, the natural inclination seems to be people want to push down on the file <coughs> from the top. Excuse me, I'm dying, I've got teeth. There we go, T apply and revived. Um, don't do this, please. Uh, it's hard on your joints. Uh, you are likely to uh, put blisters here. And this would be a, really me. This would be a much better way to hold your file. Usually file handles have a groove here and this should give you enough push. You're not pushing down, you are pushing across the top of what you're working on. Um, if it's not cutting as fast as you like, you need to learn more patience or try a different file. So I've got this pretty much worked out. There's three spots here. I think I circled them in the next one that are a little bit lower than sort of the depth of my file tooth marks here. You can see a good, I was a good person. I did proper cross cutting. Um, they're okay. There, by the time I go through all the sanding grits, it will not be a problem. They're starting around 220 with silicone grit. This could have, would have been done with stones, uh, nice flat stones uh, to get the exact same effect. This is the modern solution. This is what my shop has. So I pull the die across the paper and I think, here we go. So I hold the die. Uh, how would I dress? If it was a, if it was a mug that had no handle, you put your hand all the way around the die, and I put it where number one is, and holding it firmly flat against the paper, and holding the paper down with my left hand, as you can see, I drag the die across the piece of paper. Then I turn the die, see my terrible arrow, a quarter turn, and I go to point number three, and I repeat it again. And I sort of work my way around the piece of paper because I like to use up the whole piece of sandpaper. And uh, they do get a bit uh, a bit clogged, as it were. So that's after 220, looking better. Still some like significant scratches. We're going to keep going. Keep going. Uh, Any questions so far? There's a question that just popped up on chat from Gus about sure. a question about polishing. Uh, yes, wow. sure. I'm a big fan of metal polishing. I, yep. um, when you were doing this, um, you were drawing it across once and then you were turning it and doing yep. the 220 grit, you were going around. What, what, why were you doing that instead of just going one way all the time? To keep the scratches? I turn, sorry, keep going. Like when I'm polishing metal for uh, a telegraphic like analysis, like I, I polish it all one way and then when I switch to sandpaper, I turn it 90 degrees and polish the uh, like perpendicular to the first scratches. Mm -hmm. you see all the, like all the lines disappear. So I'm curious about why you're turning it every little bit because that's really interesting. Uh, it, it is a really easy way to make sure I don't be heavy handed on one side, thus tilting the top of my die face out of square. That's really, so I'm going to try that because I've noticed that I have that problem when yeah. I try and do it one way and then my, my flat isn't really flat. It's a bit like, you know, unflat, whatever the opposite of unflat is. Yeah, there's a slight no, uh, angle to it. Yeah. No, no. Thanks. Have, no, you no any, have you tried uh, doing this with a belt sander at all? Is it uh, equally easy there or? 
Um, certainly people do. Uh, I would be less inclined to the belt sander, and if a lot of belt sanders have like a disc sander attached to it. I have absolutely used my lapidary setup to polish, uh, to sort of grind the face of the die. That's unfair. Not, most people don't have that, so it's not really, you know, this is how to do it with the least. You can apply as many more effective tools as you like. I I've, I've found not using the belt sander because the time it takes to switch the belt sander out, yes, belt and and set it up and track it right. And now, if I had like twelve belt sanders, and I would set them up all. <laughs> yep, it takes me about it took me about a half hour. I clocked it. I'm like, how long does this really? Yeah, it took me about a half hour to do the face by hand from you know cut rod. So it's not, when I did it as sort of a complete newbie, it was about an hour or so. Yeah. It's not an offensive amount of time, but it is the grind. So yes, you can use other tools. You want them to be flat. You want, you know, by the time I pretty much always, even though I was using my lapidary setup, by the time I get to a thousand grit, I'm doing it by hand because I am steadier working slower. And when you do when you make a mistake at speed, it's a bigger mistake to fix if you've made it. All right, so 360, uh, carrying on, I'm cutting in the different directions, as they say, just turning it, keeps it flat. I do also think, because you're cutting off the hills. So as you change the direction, you're, you're slicing off the tops of the hills and trying to get down to the valley. Small scale. Um, 600. Uh, starting to see shinier. You can actually see a reflection of the P here. I think I put a Sharpie marker. There we go. Um, so it's pretty shiny at this point, um, though it's hard to shoot that. Uh, 1000 grit. There we go. Looking quite good. Um, this is what we're going to be putting into the face of it. Because uh, I should have done this a long time ago, and here we go. Uh, <laughs> this is our Moneyers Guild arms. Dietrich, take it away. Uh, <laughs> Tell the fine people about our arms. Yeah, so this is the this is the badge of the the Money Years Guild here, uh, which we have actually registered it. Right now, the badge belongs to both me and Orla, but once we get our uh, the guild charter set up, uh, we should we're going to be transferring ownership of this to the kingdom. Yep. I have a question. Sure. Um, you went up to a thousand grit. Do you go any higher than that? Uh, when I have the sandpaper kicking around, yes. Does it make a big difference on the coins? No, but I also sometimes will use a, a polishing compound uh, when I get to the brass brush, brush stage. Right, so it's all annealed, and so you're, you can grave yep. it pretty easily. Yes. Like, okay. And we never harden the uh, dyes. Um, we are not typically doing runs big enough for degradation to be a problem. Uh, some folks out there in the known world and the Interkingdom Moneyers Guild, please go there. Their Facebook group is amazing. Um, I've done a lot of Moneyers Guild. Stuff. So if you want to talk offline sometime about that, it's yeah, it's way uh, easier than you think if you have the right it, recipes. I and I I have the tools and gear to do it, but I really haven't seen any face breakdown to the point that I'm concerned about it. Uh -huh. um, I struck up to 500 coins. I think I think Ed and Ryland are the ones who've done the most off of. And it's not a problem yet. Oh, great. Good, good to know. Thanks. Yep. Sorry for uh, If you're striking something mean like brass, then you might want to harden your dye. Um, but in the uh, uh, tin alloys, um, whether it's tin antimony or we recently just did a batch of tin silver and it's delightful. Um, they're soft, they're mushy. When I'm doing fine silver, it's beautiful. It squashes delightfully. Um, yeah, and okay. you figure, you know, you, you want to, you know, keep it, keep it annealed while you're, you're applying punches and engravers to it. Uh, oh, heavens, yes. Yeah, because yeah, otherwise you're going to have a hell of a time. Yeah, any hardening is at the far end of the world and, and then um, at the end of the finishing of the die before you start striking. Can I All ask right, a question so, on that? Absolutely. Um, I know how one anneals metal, but how does one harden it? But uh, different metals are hardened differently. Um, steel typically are brought up to a certain temperature and then um, 
remember in self quench. Yeah, you, I think you quench it. Yeah. You harden it, yeah. and then you, if you want to yeah. temper it, it's and then are different... quenched. And right. different steels are quenched in oil or in water, uh, depending on their characteristics. Okay, thank you. I have. A I do the harden. That I go for it. Sorry. I have a book on this that I can up upload. Um, Absolutely. Got recipes and explains the hardening of tool steels in a really. Yep. Like I understood it really well, which was really great because I had to learn it quickly for work. Mm -hmm. and it involves like more, like bringing it up to temperature and holding it, and then bringing it down to a not to cold, but to a certain minimum temperature, and then putting it back in this in the oven. And once you like, I'll post it. Um, can I post files to Zoom yeah. or? You can, and uh, you should do it okay. sooner than later because sometimes they take a while to download across the platform. Okay, well, um, I can do that or I can go to your Money Gold Guild Facebook group and post it. Absolutely. There. I'll do it there then. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you can also uh, send an email to Odette and basically on the, the Fruits of Our Labor website that can okay. be also be posted there. And it's, yeah. it's an open source Google book, so I got it. So it's, I, I don't believe it's illegal to have. <laughs> good, good, good. Well, we, I'm we, not going to tell we, anyone if you don't. <laughs> yeah, we prefer to stay on the right side of our queen and sovereign um and, and not just our regional one um so moving on uh because any hardening would have been at the far end of theirs and we'll mention it when the point is too okay uh doing the very very simple thing is finding the center of a circle so on the broad assumption that your die stock is mostly circular which was not always true of medieval ones we'll let that pass someday i will have some blacksmiths uh, make us a beautiful set of period uh, dies, and then we will have to uh, cut in and erase new coins as we want to make new coins. But for now, these are uh, very economical, and they are mostly round. So I'm able to put my dividers on one side of the circle and use them to trace and find the center of the circle. Here is how I do it most commonly. And go the right direction. Okay. So I have put a center point marker in there. What I did is I held the dividers and I made a little tiny arc at where I thought the divider was more or less in the center. If you do that four or six times or five times, I've shown it with Sharpie, the little tiny arcs will frame within them a small shape, depending on how many lines you've made, where in the center is in the center of that shape. So that is the center of my die, which means uh, more or less as long as all my dies, all my dies are carved roughly on center, I can switch um, different moneyers marks for different faces. Um, this is a carbide tool in a quick change handle, and it's just what I use to make my centering mark. It makes a nice fine point, and I do it by sort of wiggling around the center. I'm listening to a lesson here. So. And there we go. So I've got the center. I like it. I've got a good mark on it. I've got my nicely sharpened dividers here. And I'm going to mark a circle that is a little short of three quarters of an inch, um, which is very close to the medieval penny. Uh, this sort of comes in at about 19 millimeters. Um, so it's a good size. And for our production uses three quarters of an inch. You can get lots of dies and punches to cut out the blanks at that size. So it's very good on a production sale. Uh, the divider slid up the side. This is just me burnishing out a mistake. This is a burnisher at the very tip of one. And you can see where this little line came off the side. And I just remove that track because when I go to cut the outline, uh, I don't want my graver to get caught in a different, we'll call it a tire track. Uh, those of you who are in snowy places in the world, if you get stuck in a set of tire tracks and uh, the car ahead of you goes off, you are very likely to go off the rails. So the same is true uh, when using your graver around the outside of something. So I burnished that back so that I was less likely to go off the rails there. I was wondering, because I was just like, that's going to be outside the coin face. So. Oh, yeah. It doesn't matter aesthetically yeah, at all. Yeah, that's why I was going, why? But you, you've you explained a, a perfectly logical reason. One of all the right. easy ways to avoid that uh, when you're engraving on uh, metal is to 
put your guide circle in one direction and then engrave in the other. And that way you're not, your graver will not be inclined to follow any missed tracks anyway. Yep. Um, here's just laying out. So the center embattled borderline, Dietrich, you mean mean human. Um, <laughs> I'm sure there was a reason that had to be there, uh, but it's small and fiddly. So I'm laying out the line work here. Um, any point that crosses the middle and touches both sides is going to divide the circle in half. Uh, mostly I use my eyeballs to figure out what is actually square there. Uh, I made it a bit too wide initially, so I think I brought the ladder in by later and then tried to divide up the border. A couple millimeters is what I'm going for. Um, is good for that, which sort of shows you the overall size and scale we're working at. Don't mind my dirty fingernails. The uh, legend, the text that runs around the outside of the die, and remember everything on this die is supposed to be backwards. I ask you to remember this because I nearly forgot it on this die. Um, everything has to be backwards. Um, but I need uh, two and a half millimeters in here because that is the size of my letter punches. Uh, my letter punches are mostly not actual letters, but they're components of a letter, and we will get to that shortly. Uh, another scribe I've got, so I'm tracing in. You can actually see I'm sort of, I used a pencil to make those smaller because I realized I needed to get more embattlements in an even smaller area after I left room for our writing. All right, this is where I believe I absolutely nearly did it all wrong. Uh, that is how I need the finished coin to look. And uh, that's a problem because the die has to be in reverse. So the uh, golden orbs have to be on this side and hammers have to be on this side. But I you know, checked myself before I wrecked myself. So in a minute. Oh, we're going to talk about gravers. So I went, and sharpened, I went and sharpened gravers and then I came back to the die later. Uh, talking a bit about graver sharpening. This is the thing that is very complex tool to make the job a whole lot easier. Uh, my gravers are quick change gravers from GRF. They're delightful. It means I can have a couple handles and I've got about 30 uh, here. Am I spotlighted? Or when I'm screen sharing, it only shows the big screen, right, Dietrich? Uh, correct, although I can see you off in the little side view. Okay, don't worry about it. Um, so anyways, I'll show you my gravers later. Here's how many I had to sharpen before I was going to do this die. I have a lot of gravers because I don't like sharpening very often. Uh, me and math and getting things right ways or wrong ways are an issue because it's not you. Good fun. Um, so here's a whole pile of them. I actually have them color coded for shape. And so my squared gravers have this maroon color and my flats are this pale blue. I've got a bunch of round gravers. And my best round gravers are made out of old bulbers. So this tool and my lapidary setup. So this is a 1200 grit diamond plate. Uh, I use to do 45 degree face on all the gravers. And the face is this portion you can see here. Uh, the angle has to do with how metal is carved away. Um, you can have different face angles for different materials, but generally 45 degrees works well for everything I handle. Um, there we go, that's a better image of the face. So this face here is at 45 degrees to the length of the graver, and that allows the metal to come up. These are the bulbers I was talking about. Um, I just snap the heads off, uh, shape the bottom of them, and those are the cheapest round gravers you can shake a stick at, um, and they work brilliantly. Uh, so here's all of them mid-sharpening. Now it's really hard to show this. I should have tried to take a picture under my microscope. After I cut the faces on all of them, and um, some of them get what's called a heel. So you see this bright line I'm showing, dragging my cursor along. Mm -hmm. That is called the heel and it's done at about 15 degrees and it helps it cut through the metal without binding up. Um, there's a little bit better, you know, this is the size, there's a hair, it's about two 
two hair widths. Not quite. Uh, it might even be too big, but it works fine for me. Um, and there's the face and everything else that's on this piece on the top side that's cut away. It's just to make less to polish and shape each time. So that is a square graver. There's my host of gravers. Here's a bunch of like marking tools and burnishing tools over here that I use. And then my gravers are over here. Uh, punches. How do we get letters? Uh, letters are built up of components. Uh, if any of you have done scribal, you think of an E as a long stick and a short stick with a serif you know, in the middle and then longer sticks with serif at the end and then you get an E. So this set of punches actually has sort of two or three more than you need for the minimum. If you took out these ones here, you can get by making it the entire Roman alphabet with about seven punches. Um, punches are hardened. Um, so you do all of the work to shape. Let's look at this sort of serif die shape. You know, you file, you sand, you cut sort of bevels here so that you can see where you're striking it. Then you heat it up to red hot, quench it in oil, and then you polish it and take off the fire scale. And then you gently anneal it to straw. Annealing is heating it up uh, very gently in a controlled manner um, to take some of the hardness out because that's very, very hard. It, they tend to be very, very brittle. Um, and we don't want to break them, but we still need them harder than the die that we are punching into. Better image of them all. Um, a couple of common things. You will see these often at the start, the beginning of the legend or the words that go around um, across. The, this is a long sort of wide dot, fair serif and a, a circle punch that I use for a lot of different things. And then a Y, just because why not? All right. So I sharpened all the gravers. And I still, if I look closely, have not fixed the drawing on the die, but I do eventually. So I'm cutting. This is my first little cut I've actually cut from about here to there. And I cut the outside circle first. Um, and I brace my finger here on the outside of the die and my thumb here. And then I turn this. I have a ball vise. You can do it without a ball vise. Uh, if you have a bolster, uh, which we'll talk about later, which is a giant hunk of metal or wood designed to fit the die that goes in the bottom, you can use that and slowly turn it, uh, turn the die in your hand counterclockwise while your hand with the graver actually moves very little. Um, so trying to show that. There is, I have gone the first full pass all the way around and that long stringy curl uh, means I did a decent job sharpening my graver and was able to take it all off in one curve. I will go over this a number of times. I do this by hand with no power. There's a pretty curl. Any questions of what I'm doing right now in here? It looks like Gus has a question. Um, I oh, couldn't hear it. what you were calls you were saying your gravers were made from. Uh, high speed steel for the most part. Uh, when I'm cutting the steel dies, I have carbide gravers. Uh, they have a beautiful polish, and but I tend to break them way faster than I like. Uh, the high speed steel is more durable uh, against another steel. Uh, the way I use them. So do you get that from secondhand materials and make them or do you go buy the high speed steel from? The high speed steel I buy for my square gravers. Um, it's not that expensive. A graver blank shouldn't cost you much more than I'd say $15. And it can be broken in half and set into two handles or in these small quick change handles. Sometimes I will uh, cut them under water or oil and I can get three gravers out of one. Um, all of my round uh, gravers, uh, since the ones I bought as a student, um, have been made out of bobbers. Um, I can't because hear that word. What is that word? Ball. Nope. <laughs> I 
I don't know what you, it's like ball burgers. You, you echoed it when he said it. So, uh, 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 want to type it into the chat, perhaps, Orla? Burger. I think she's trying to say ball headed burrs. Ball headed burrs. Uh, I think I have to stop sharing to do that. Um, I will show you later. How about that? Perfect. I will. <laughs> yes. I will show you all later. I promise. Remind me if I forget. Okay. Cutting lines. Um, okay. These lines of the. Oops. Did she just leave? It looks like she was having connection problems. Yeah, so Oops. she may have just gotten booted out. Might just be her Wi-Fi. Well, I think the simplest thing to do to get coins is just take them from someone's manor house. <laughs> that's the Scottish technique. It's that's a thief. <laughs> I think let's do it better than you Scotsmen do. Yeah, they stole that too from the Scots. Didn't see you guys. Uh, exactly. What do you mean steal? We just Hello, rescue things from burning buildings. Yes, exactly. Oh, well, that's she's the Norse approach. Yeah, she's back. Yay! Hey. Yay. By the way, this is Hi. my first tool All right. I'm enjoying this. <laughs> that's good. All right, screen share. Let's try this again. We should start where I was. Maybe. Screen share. Nothing. Cool. Ah, okay. We can continue where we were. Sorry, guys. Um, all right. More or less. There we go. Okay. Um, Actually, if uh, Orla's having connection issues, it might help so if people cutting turn the embattlement. Off. That'll uh, cut down on the amount of bandwidth that uh, people require. I do it with mine as well. Yep. Okay. Um, it could be our house too. We don't usually have problems, but I did get dropped once yesterday. Finishing the embattlement. We're going to get to punching soon. Uh, Plato is my secret weapon for checking to see if my die depth is good. Um, and I will show that later. I finally fixed where I have the hammers and the coins. Uh, on the die, testing out how the lettering has to be because we are intending to have these be uh, brooches or pins or have something riveted to them. I expect I'm going to turn mine into winning this hook, the so leg wrap hook, making sure what we want to fit in there will fit in there. It's very backwards and that is very correct. Um, here is finally punching things. So I used one of the round punches. Uh, I reshaped it because I wanted it to be just so. And I am punching the pelleted background. And then I'm going to start punching the outlines for the hammer. So I used my eye stamp, because it was roughly the shape I wanted, to punch into the metal the shape I want. You will actually see a bit of a lip here, that gets dealt with later. There's more sanding. There's always more sanding. No, that's not true. There are period examples where they don't need a flat area for a different surface treatment. Uh, so, three eye punches, a couple extra little punches, and then I'm doing the pelleted border. This is done by setting this punch. It's with and a little bit past the last punch hole uh, so that the next circle you do does not displace material into the previous circle you made. Uh, sometimes I win, sometimes I lose. Um, so you can sort of see the spacing. Um, there are places where I was a bit too close and the circles do not look properly and fully circle. And then there are places where they are nice and circles, um, and some other places where you will probably see the graver mark underneath, and all of that is seen on many different coins 
from the time. And so this says backwards, uh, my craft goes this way. Now a little crowded at the tail end. There's a dot, there may be a oh, we lost her again. Yep, pray to. Uh oh. I thought I got lost because uh my entire screen went white there. <laughs> Yeah, yeah well, I do. It's because she, she was no longer sharing, and because we've all turned off video. Uh, so, Dietrich, can you talk about the money guild? Hi, oh. I'm Mac. All right, later. Hey. hey. Yeah. I'm back. Have you guys got me? Yep. Did he? Okay. I'm going to keep trying to go faster through this. I think asking it to screen share is not brilliant. Uh, what am I doing here? Okay. Um, so I like most of my details. Deep enough. I made the hammers a bit deeper. Uh, then I am going to sand this. I'm actually going to sand this. I'm the material that is displaced when I use the punches. Uh, so you. Thank you, computer. Yes, my internet connection is unstable. Or let um, you turn off your video. Anyway, uh, so I continue standing until I have a relative. Uh, on the sidebar, yes. Yeah, that I can might do help that. Yeah. And so here is why I stand. Oh no! Ah, the joys of technology. Right. Hey, Trick. Yes. Let's just go. Let's just go liberate coins. <laughs> we and you and I both enjoy fighting. Indeed. Listen, like to, listen. I'll I'll come join you. I miss like, fighting. We like long weapons, so we can socially distance. <laughs> oh, spear, perfect. spear thieving. Yes, yes. Spear Spears and great swords. Woohoo! Yeah. So Darn way, it, my... I haven't got my authorization yet for something other than a shield. Hey, so, so <laughs> Trick, I don't think you need an authorization. <laughs> All right. Is she back? Uh, I think she's back, yeah. Yay. Okay, I'll shut up. Yeah. We believe in you, Orla's computer. You can do it. Oh, my understanding is that the... Um, the punching around the uh, circumference it, on uh, medieval coins was to give an indicator of if the coin had been shaved for part of its uh, um, weight value in, in the metal. Yes, that's certainly... Uh, well, there is a, a punching around the edge, edging. However, if you look at a lot of period coins, although they do have that dotted thing, the strike is so like not centered that in many cases that wouldn't actually be that helpful that's true one of the there is actually a use for it though um having that ring of dots around the edge is very good it sort of basically creates a grip for the coin blank so when you put it between the dies you know you can put it there and it's very likely to stay put when you strike rather than skip and move that's neat. Um, modern coins are, of course, stamped in big, big machines, and every coin is aligned face and 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 um, the the reverse with perfect alignment over billions of coins. Were they that fussy about that in on um, period coins? Could you get them? Not particularly. I mean, generally speaking, they would try and align them, you know, but it would be more like there'd be a mark in the die, you know, of sort of, you know, like these are the two up faces. Um, yeah, it's a, and obviously there's, there's not going to be any sort of machine precision yeah. of those strikes. An attempt was made. Yeah, Fundament Not the, the, the important the important point of the of the dies, right? And 
the, the coin strike is basically to indicate who authorized it, so basically the face of the king, who struck the coin, that would be the mon, uh, the moneyer's mark face, right, and the weight. Because basically it's saying that, you know, it's a, th this coin was minted under the authority of who, who and this person, the, the striker, testifies that, yes, this is actually a good coin, right? And so as long as it's got those three elements of the correct weight and the markings, whether or not it was and from an artistic sense, correct, wasn't really relevant. Did I understand at the start of this that uh, she's using 1018 steel for the dies? That's what I heard, yes. Yeah, that, that's essentially mild steel. I'm surprised that you even bother to quench and harden it at all. It's, it's mostly to, uh, to stop it from mushrooming. Okay. Yeah, you'll get a tiny bit of hardening out of it. Yeah, uh, is there yeah. a reason you don't use 1095 or something with higher carbon content? I have no idea how to answer that one, unfortunately. Mostly it was the one that was recommended to us, and it is readily available. And although it does mushroom a fair bit, it's easy to grind off, and I haven't had any fall off, and I've made some pretty ugly at the back end so far. So I'm going to try and not screen share with you guys anymore. So you are going to lose out on my wonderful, uh, terrible slideshows with uh, talking points. And you can put your slideshow up on the tool website yeah. after the fact, right? I will. Um, and I <laughs> will try and share the video as well that way. And I guess um, we will see if this gets more stable. Uh, it did appear to be a problem at my end. I don't think it's a Zoom problem. Um, because my computer kept told, telling me my connection was unstable. So I took the phone off. Uh, so we only have one device uh, hoovering up uh, what bandwidth we have. Um, doo -doo -doo. Totally lost my place. Uh, you were showing oh, yeah. the... Oh, you got it. No, uh, yep, just thinking. Okay. Uh, so... <laughs> this isn't awkward at all, I swear to you. Um, so I was at the point where, um, I was about to start, I don't know how much of slides show you guys saw, uh, I sanded this down, I applied a, uh, multi-line, uh, like almost a Florentine finish to show hatching, which is the medieval way to show colors in a black and white image, uh, it's usually done, uh, through engraving, uh, the directions of the line. Uh, so fine lines up and down vertically uh, indicate red, a uh, tiny dotted surface indicates or, um, azure is lines that are parallel to the ground, um, and there's a very variety of literal cross hatchings, and I can't remember which one to switch for that offhand. Um, so to show that something is red without being able to color it in, um, it has very fine uh, tiny up and down lines. And uh, that's a really neat convention. It is. I didn't and you'll that. see it in engravings and in black and white drawings of heraldry. I don't know how good that's catching the Yeah, I'm not seeing but... the, the line. I mean, I can see the yeah. rest of the coin pretty well. But... Yeah. Uh, anyways, so they are there and they do show off. But it's, you know, it's useful. It's a neat little texturing way that, um, you know, you can read color without there being color, which is kind of fun. Mm. Um, are you making your own blanks or are you buying them or do you make them out of like, like can you talk about the blanks a little bit or? I yep, I can. Uh, um, they're, they're, they're a good spot to be next up. Uh, the answer to all of that is yes. Uh, so I have bought many, many aluminum blanks from the Ring Lord. Uh, so, bowringlord.com, um, and although they're a Canadian supplier, all their prices are in U.S. dollars, uh, be that as it may. Uh, sometimes they have quarter inch brass blanks, not often. Uh, he typically has aluminum ones, which are very cheap. I um, uh, think it was somewhere in the range of $6 per hundred. Uh, so, if you look at life hours, that's very, very affordable. Uh, recently, I have been made a bunch, uh, I can't read my writing on this, but it is 
97% tin and 3% silver. I had pictures in my slideshow of alloying that. Uh, how that is done is I heat up a handheld sort of pouring crucible um, and I melt uh, the three grams of silver and I have ready to drop into that another three grams of tin. So once this silver is liquid and melted, you add in a very small amount of the alloy because, sorry, the reason you do it in that order is the silver has a much, much higher melting temperature than the tin. The tin is somewhere in the 300s. The silver is somewhere over 1600 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, so you have to melt the silver first um, and then add the tin to that. So the first little bit of tin you drop into that 1600 degrees of uh, silver, um, some of it is probably literally vaporizing and some of it goes in and becomes an alloy and it lowers the overall melting temperature of that now six grams of material. Then into that, we're going to continue to feed in uh, increasing amounts of the other, you know, uh, 97 grams of tin. By the time you are done, the whole alloy has cooled off considerably to much closer to its final normal melting temperature, which again is somewhere in the 300, 400s range. Um, and then I pour them into ingots. I have an ingot mold. See if I can unplug and we'll go walk and talk. Uh, right. So, can you guys see this well enough? I need to hear from you because I can't, I'm holding my laptop yep. away from me. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, it's, you got melted metal in here. You pour it into the ingot mold, you allow it to cool for a bit, and then you knock it out, and you end up with an ingot like so. Now, when you have a tiny army of apprentices, you can then drop it onto an anvil. I don't have enough hands to hold this. And you could peen and lengthen it out that way. But I have this. Uh, and so then I run them through the rolling mill. You have your mechanical apprentice. I have my I have my use of a mechanical force. Rolling mills were a thing in late period. Um, most of the money I like producing is not late period, but I'm gonna let that slide. So this is, see if I can hold it out here, about yeah, a meter, so yep, about a meter that I have made one coin with width wide. I don't know whether you can see the coin overlaid. My ingot mold actually is a little narrow for that. So I actually usually hit it across the length of the other direction to widen the ingot before I run it through the rolling mill. So I still have to hammer it, but way less. These, then I typically cut them using a disc cutter. This is a fairly nice one. So you would take this out. Well, I don't have a short piece. That would have made my life easy. You insert this into the mold, into between the two plates. You put that back in. This one tightens down. I have a more simple one that you do not have to tighten down. I grab a smaller hammer and I go. For those of us who don't have disc cutters, uh, you can get three quarter inch round punches as well. Uh, I will show one of those in a sec once I pull so this cool. out. It's like a paper punch. Like it is. Paper yeah. punches are modeled after these beasts. It looks a little like the device you use to make make your own buttons. Like. Oh yes, yes it does. Yeah. Now the the, the disc cutter is definitely going to give you a a nicer round shape. You can use a three quarter punch. Uh, I find there's still a fair amount of. You you'll have to clean up the edges afterwards, but. 
that is it might not is not necessarily a bad thing because it gives it that sort of not perfect look to it, which gives, makes it gives it a medieval shape to it. Since of course, yeah. My uh, slideshow shows a whole lot of the my head Bitcoin slideshow shows a lot of the. I did the sort of three or four different ways to cut out a blank. Um, so cutting with shears which was by far the most common way in period. Um, and it works up pretty quickly. I use a very small set of shears um, and they work remarkably. I feel like I need a white sheet of paper here. Hold on. Really, you don't have to have a ton of complicated equipment to do this. You can start Ooh. pretty like basic. Absolutely. It is very, very accessible. All right. I've lost a coin. There we go. Penny's lost. I'm not chasing him now. Um, so since we're doing this all live, you totally wanted a live class. All right. Here is my bolster. It is strapped to a log, a fairly large hardwood log I scavenged off the side of the road when they were trimming trees. And I can strike a coin for all of you. That's what one of my videos was, and that's half the fun of being here. I sort of just so you rolling a log down the si the sidewalk. Really, you should have pictured me uh, putting it into the back of my father's uh, Crown Victoria. Um, <laughs> it was fabulous. I had traded in the cars. I own a van, but of course, when I see the right log, I don't have the van with me um, because I had loaned it to him for him to carry something heavy. All right, so I put in my die. Let's see. Here, I'm going to do this again. Contrast. Nope. And I have a lot of metal tools on the same stump, again, to add mass. Eh, it's not bad. So, yeah, OK. Here is the die. This is the bolster. It is a giant hunk of steel with a hole drilled through it that my friend who does machining over-engineered so I can actually unscrew the bottom piece because he over-engineered it. I use a sleeve um, because the thought of crushing someone's hands terrifies me and because I don't quite have enough uh, muscles to swing it one-handed. I can and I have um, when I have to do many, many coins, I am much more comfortable doing it this way. So I roughly line up. I take off my safety first. Oh, I can see the hatching this time. Oh, very, very nice. And then repeat many, many times. I will point out again, is for those of you who don't have a friend who can over-engineer things, um, what for my bolster, it's just, I have a, I also have a log, but it's, I've just got a uh, one inch round hole drilled down into it, at the bottom of which there's about a quarter inch or half inch disc of metal that I've shoved to the bottom of it. And I use, for my sleeve, I have a 3x3 three three block of wood with a 1-inch round hole drilled, um, which I find actually to be quite effective because it can be a little tight and it kind of grips the uh, uh, it gri grips the dies in a way that you, you know, to do with the, the metal sleeve would require some precision engineering. Yep, absolutely. Um, the the general line on it is uh, mass kicks ass. Um, when you look at pictures of money setups in the medieval times, uh, often you sort of saw a wooden holder or a metal holder in a giant, I want to call it a sandbox because it's sort of what it is. And they were these benches and they were loaded with sand. So an incredible amount because you want the force that you apply 
um, to go to the thing that is the softest, which is your coin, not to be you know, lie around or, you know, chase. I wouldn't, couldn't imagine striking that now without it bolted down to something. Um, and ratchet straps are the simplest thing. Uh, it means I can take my bolster to an event. And even if there's rules against transporting firewood, I can find an appropriate log and away we go. Uh, CMS. <laughs> Thanks, Joey. All right, so let's field some questions because uh, most of my plans have gone to pot and I'm okay with that. What would people like to know about at this point? I said I would show something for the, what was it going to be that I was going to show? Bulber. Uh, Bulber, got it. Okay. A very big one, but to be quite honest, the ones that tend to burn out the most are very small. This is a very large bulber to the tune of six or eight millimeters. It will probably never die. This is also a bulber. It's about two millimeters. I, I don't know if anyone regularly. else. Oh, there we go. There we go. Talk to you soon. Okay. So. Now, now we can see you. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah, you, your screen froze, so yeah. that, that's uh, one. But just as I was about to say it, uh, then it stopped. Okay, this is a very large one. It will probably never burn out. These are fairly small ones. Um, sometimes they burn out. Sometimes they snap off. Uh, other terrible things happen to them. And then I simply use them as gravers fit into get up into camera range. These are the same thing. Uh, very, very cheap. Um, there are people who take drill rod and make their own gravers. Um, I see no reason why that shouldn't work and be fine. Um, you, most people get used to using the tools they have and learn to work with them. Uh, as I said, the really fancy gravers that are the carbide ones to give like bright cutting effects. Um, they're nice. They're lovely. I can get them to a very, very fine polish, uh, but they tend to be brittle and chip off. And uh, sorry, remind us again what the, the bulbers are used for? In turning them into gravers. What's their original purpose? Uh, for grinding out metal. They are basically a, a spherical file that is used with a, uh, a flexible motor handpiece. Oh, kind of like a, like a Dremel uh, attachment. Yes. Thing. Yeah. Gotcha. I call it a flex shaft, but yes, it is a, a motor with a flexible shaft that runs from it and that applies the spin power to a handpiece that holds the tool. <laughs> Sorry, say again, Omar? Is that a rotary tool? Yes, rotary tool. There we go. Um, I'll just chime in as Lachlan here. Uh, I've done some engraving on steel uh, a lot uh, for other projects. And I will say uh, high speed steel uh, drill rod is good, but if you can get it, uh, and most metal supermarkets in Canada will carry it, H13 uh, steel uh, is an air hardening um, steel that actually works really well for engraving tools. Uh, on steel? Sorry? On steel, yep. yes. Particularly on steel, yeah. yep. Su super hard. Uh, blacksmiths make everything from power hammer dies to engravers out of it uh, okay. because it's an air hardening uh, uh, one. So you just bring it up to red hot and then leave it to cool on a surface? Exactly. There's no, uh, no water quench, okay. no oil quench, and uh, it uh, has enough flexibility into it that you don't really have to do a lot of heat treating afterwards. Uh, you do need to bring it up to 495, I believe it is, in an oven for about 30 minutes, and then let okay. it air cool after that, and it uh, it will be as hard as any. Oh, that's good, because then people could do it at home with a plumber's torch and their home oven. Exactly. Yeah, Beautiful. so the, the hardening process for it, if anyone's using it, is up to red hot, quench it, up to 495 in the oven. I believe it's 30 minutes. Just Google that, be certain. Uh, and then let it air cool. It's uh, as hard as anything. Yet your files will skate right off. 
Okay, so wait a sec. Up to red hot, quench it. How? Yes. So quench it in water or a salt okay. quench, either or. Okay. Um, and then bring it. At, so the normal hardening process for steel is up to red hot, quench. That makes big, big, uh, big particles in the steel mark site, it's called. And yep. then when you, when you bring it up to a subsequent temperature and cool it, uh, you're then changing that structure down to a more easily, uh, uh, a less uh, brittle uh, state. So if you just okay. take it, so the air it cooling part is on the annealing. Um, got it. But that's a home uh, home one, and it's an air hardener, so it's uh, it's relatively easy to do. Okay. Yep. Cheers. Okay. Oh, I lost you, but okay. Um, yeah, we've done uh, tool making at a uh, full event previously. I think we did it last year. Uh, and it went well. Most people got through making a couple of punches, usually a dot and a line, are sort of the first two to get started on to practice making punches. Yeah, and making punches is, is not difficult in any way. No, and I mean, you, you can never have too many, right? Yeah, I mean, if you're if you're making, you can make complex punches. Although we found that you know the more surface area on a punch you have, uh, the harder it is to get a good, like a, a deep enough impression. Uh, yeah. But, but for most of the basic shapes, yeah, it's it's you know pretty simple to to do. Yep, I have a Y from the Sinrith of Mercia coin, and um, it takes a whole lot more force to strike that uh, well. Uh, than it does to build up a letter from a series of three or four smaller thinner lines. Well, um, we have a full hour left. Should I try screen sharing again? What do you all say? You might lose me again. Well, we'll give it a shot if it keeps going off the rails then we'll uh... as as we are living in Eldermere, i could seriously understand make, just making a trillium stamp to yes. save time yeah you absolutely could uh in place of that i've actually done a teardrop shaped stamp a very small one it's about a millimeter and a half long uh, and that allows me to uh kind of get away with using three of them to make a trillium shape. All right, so I'm going the wrong way, but all right. Uh, I do not know where I lost you in the slideshow, but I'm going to go back a ways. Okay. If so, I recall, uh, it was the, uh, yeah, it was about here when you were looking at the, uh, uh, the play -Doh. The very highly technical impression taking clay. I mean, kids play doh. It's perfect. Um, it actually, I save them uh, because I have some coin dice where I've shown like the progression of making them. And so you take uh, an impression when you do the outside ring, and you take an impression when you do the letters, and you take an impression. And it sort of shows the process as it goes. Uh, and they dry and they shrink to about a third, their, uh, sorry, two thirds their size. And it's kind of fun. Uh, I told you, sorry again. That's a, that's a really neat way to archive your work. Yeah, it's kind of fun. I like It's, it's very cathartic, too, to yeah. just stick it in a blob. <laughs> yeah. Like, no, really, I'm making progress. See, they're different. Um, okay, so for the last, I don't know how many years, I have been dragging this lovely hand crank model around, uh, and it does a perfectly fine job of it. Uh, but I finally uh, begged my father to, uh, he got a new bench grinder, so I asked for his old one. Uh, I simply had never added it to the shop because I don't usually do large metal working activities. Most of my work in jewelry fits within a three inch square and this is excessive. For the back end of the dies, it makes my life a lot easier. So I'm going to put a good size uh, 45 degree bevel on the tail end, like so, because you have to be careful that your bottom die does not wedge itself permanently into your bolster. It's not going to happen so much with wood, uh, but it absolutely will bind itself into the metal bolster. So you have to periodically make sure that your bottom die comes out. Uh, so I put a bevel down there, and then I file off, I'm used, here is where your PPE, um, and then I grind off a little bit, um, 
about half a millimeter off the back end of the die. The first strikes of the coins, I probably went back in and made a few touch-ups on things. Uh, there's an empty area in the legend, and that's to do rivets. I'll show you those later. There we are. Here's a run of them. Uh, not bad. Fairly well centered. Um, there are people who are much better at striking than me, and I am happy to have them have at uh, as they like. Actually, you can see a little bit of the hatching I was talking about on this picture. Uh, so it's very, very fine lines, but it's the texture of it shows up. Um, this is making a pin. This is uh, sort of locating where the rivets go through. I am using uh, these narrow rods that are tapered to make the holes. This is all soft enough to do so. And this is nickel silver. Uh, so white brass. Setting the rivets. Uh, setting the rivets poorly, I should add, because of the 97% uh, tin, 3% silver alloy is really squishy. Um, I will be making one of these out of fine silver, but I think I will also rivet on the pin finding uh, because I didn't like what I did for the hook, but this was an option. And I have seen brooches made out of coins uh, in periods that had this part. And then I think they had a riveted on hook, but I also think I've seen weird things happen like this. Far too squishy in this alloy, but it made a brooch. You can see the little bit I cut off the edge with just a pair of snips. And that is the end of that one. I'll stop the share there. I will show you a good video of me smashing a coin while we appear to have connection. Share that. And I pre-recorded it because I was like, this will be easier if I pre-record it to show it to you all. Yep, seems to be working. It's tough to get them to focus close in, but so I set the lower die into the thing. I actually have a notch on the top and bottom of my die telling me, or on the top of each of my dies so I can line up uh, the heads, quote unquote, on both sides. There's my sleeve, one inch inside diameter roughly. And that's one of my money ears dies. Set on top, put down the helmet, swap the camera, line it up, <laughs> and smash. Show off pretty coin. You can see how the die jumps back up at you in the video. It does. When I'm doing a bunch of them and I'm doing well, um, you sort of try and strike through it and not have it bounce up that much because you can cause ghosting and chattering on the back side of the image. Um, but it gives you a good example of how to smash a coin. Yeah, I find with the, the wooden sleeve, uh, I don't have quite as much of a it, it coming back up again. Yeah. Although admittedly, it does mean the momentum is carried through into the stump. All right. Well, this all seems to be working. We're going to keep rolling with screen sharing. Dear Zoom, where'd you go? Screen sharing. There we go. Okay, does everybody see how to be coin silver coinage struck in how to be circa blah, 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 80, 825 to 830? Yes. Yay. All right. So here was the one coin I was trying to replicate. I think it's a delight. Uh, it makes my engraver's heart happy. Uh, but it also used a, a lot of very simple punch work. So it has a long sort of oval pelleted border. You can see the original engraving line to set the outside. So the first thing you saw when I was carving the coin was I cut that line. So did this crafts person. Um, you see punches in the serpent's eyes, in the, um, I forget the word for it, but what you use to raise the mast. You see a little bit in what may be orlocks, um, and then on the side with the facing roosters, and the eyeballs, some decorative dots. You can see that these were also dots set in along an engraved line, because you can see a bit of the 
to these little short bits of raised area. So that means they engraved it first and then punched it. And then we don't get to see a little bit of this corner of the coin, and that's where I later put my maker's mark. Um, I love those little chicken feet. <laughs> I, ju I just do. They're brilliant. I don't know why. Um, Is that a little fish under the boat? Legitimately, it's a fish under the boat. And a lot of the Viking ships, there are many coins from Hennepin, a number of them that have Viking ships. I, I argue that this is the nicest one because it's got very clear the dragon's heads on the finials. Um, a number of them have the fish under the boat. Is that just, yeah. just to remind you that boats go on water? Boats go on water and fish are, fish are essential to life. Um, for coastal peoples, um, you know, probably the best protein source you have available, um, you know, so. Scroll down. Here is a lovely period coin die. This one should be from York. Yep. Okay. Um, so yeah, I want a blacksmith to make me some of these at some point. If I'm uh, not mistaken, the that coin die is the uh, the Eric Blood Axe. Uh... It really is. And then uh, eventually the guild would use these, and every time we wanted to do a different coin, we would have to file off the old one just as they did in period. Um, you will see many, many coins uh, for different uh, kings and queens uh, throughout their reign. As dies break down, they are simply recarved, modified, tried to make so that they can last longer, or they are ground down and made anew. Um, and also different minting centers made them for the, different, for the same king and queen. Uh, here is a, an example of a strike, a test strike, just into a big piece of lead. Um, this is me sort of looking at it and trying to break it apart, trying to figure out what lines I need, how this gets built, um, and trying to clean up their images. This is, you see here where the X's are? Those are the center point marks, and they existed on the coin. Uh, I think I saw them better in another image, uh, but there is a mark where they were. So. This one does show up on the coin. Um, centering marks sometimes show up um, roughly where a king's portrait's nose is on uh, medieval coins, and that always brings me a bit of joy. Um, this is my dollar store pouring ladle. Uh, that's the back end of the spoon, so it stands on its own. Uh, an ingot rolled out and cut out. These snips were what I started with. They are way too big. This worked a heck of a lot better. And I got better quite quickly at cutting out nice round circles. Um, so here is uh, some chisel. No kidding, that's what it's called. Um, and a bunch of hand cut out pieces. These would be these fine silver. These are Alice. Can't remember which. So these are cut with a punch. Uh, you see a lot of doming. Uh, they're cut on a punch against a piece of, in this case, I think it's bronze. Um, so that you don't dull the face of this too much, but you are still able to cut through the material you are cutting through. Uh, and these would have been cut out with a uh, disc cutter, like I showed you at the corner of my workbench. Uh, pouring ingots. Um, this is a very simple ingot mold. Uh, the extra rod is to bring it down to a width so that my rolling mill will run through. And because that whip is specific to get two coins of its side. Um, bunch of coin making. Here's a better image of some of my punches. Um, a dot, a V, a Y, uh, a large crescent, a small crescent. So a large crescent like you would use for a C or a D. A uh, small crescent, you use two of these for a B. You use one on the top for an R. Uh, the eye, this is a lot of focus, and a straight line, and a short line with a serif, and a dot, and some other fun stuff over here. Uh, Low-tech transfers. Uh, I, do not have a, I, ha I do not have a printer. I have a photocopier. Um, and a photocopier saves me many hours of work. But I need to get the image. So I drew the highlights. 
noted some dimensions. So that's sort of the width of that pelleted border. There's the center mark. I then flip it over, throw it in my photocopier so it is in reverse. And I use the demo varnish transfer. And would, we all lost time. So I can tell you, I'm like, would people like to know about that transfer method? Um, because I think it's sort of brilliant. Um, so um, this is acetone. This is Damar picture varnish. I picked it up at uh, my local art supply store. Uh, this bottle is three years old. And I do use it fairly often. It will last forever um, at the rate I'm going through it. It'll probably go bad before it uh, runs out. So the varnish, uh, usually I flip the bottle over with my thumb over the top, flip it upside down, flip it back right side up, and swipe my thumb across the top of the die. Um, you want enough that it makes an even coating and so that it makes a smooth and continuous surface. Uh, you may have to give it a couple like taps on the bottom of the die for it to settle down. Uh, you allow that to dry until it is uh, almost dry, tacky enough that you can put your finger on it and take it off and leave a fingerprint that would make the SIU very, you know, oh, we can catch that person. Uh, very, very clear and but not bring any strings away with you if you're still bringing stringy tackiness away that looks like you know what happens when you touch rubber cement uh it's too wet once it is dry enough you then put cutouts of printed on a either printed on a laser printer machine or a photocopier that uses a you know laser printing ink so a heat transferred ink you flip them upside down center them and then you touch the backs of them with a cloth with a little bit of acetone in it. And I say just touch because when you touch the top, you want it to just go briefly transparent uh, across sort of the entirety. Uh, you sort of dab the surface in a number of spots um, so that it, each spot goes briefly transparent and that transfers the ink into the varnish. And then you wait for that to dry for a minute and you burnish with a burnisher the back of the paper over and over again. And once this is so burnished that you can actually see the raised pattern where the ink is behind the paper, you set them aside, leave them alone for about 10, 15 minutes till they are for sure for real dry. Uh, I am usually too impatient, but I try to work on that. Uh, and then you take them to a sink and you can submerge them in water. The paper will saturate and you can gently with your thumb rub the paper until the paper pulls off, uh, you know, fiber by fiber and pills up uh, into little tiny pellets sort of size of rice. Keep rubbing and eventually you will rub all of the paper off, but none of the Damar varnish and nor your ink. That gives you a very good way to transfer an image. And Is this why I... you had to sand the, uh, uh, the, the coin die afterwards to get rid of the varnish? No, no, the varnish doesn't last very long after you've done, after you'd end up like scribing your pattern through the varnish. Um, it's not there for very long. It's, it's, it does wear away eventually. It is more than fixed enough to get your pattern onto the die face um, or to engrave. You can just engrave this away if you're gentle and, and not mean to it. Um, you know, you're not scrubbing it with anything while you're cutting the details. Um, Here's them cut. And I have the extra one. And struck on different materials. Now it's just cut out. This is fine silver. I tried some from uh, melted pellets, forged out pellets, and sort of a quick, quick and dirty hack at it. And if I've taken a lot more time to get them flat, um, it worked reasonably well. And you will see some uh, coins that look like that. Furthermore, in like Roman times, and when they're dealing with much thicker coins, uh, they will work from much thicker pellets, um, and they are hot struck. So they're struck when the silver is like red hot. Um, but again, that's a two-man adventure, and we've got a one-woman chop here. And then there is just a bag that I'm holding them in. Uh, that is also from the same setting. 
see finished sack. I like these bags because they are very simple. And if I want to show off the coin or give them away, the whole bag can be opened out and it can be opened out into almost a bowl shape or completely flat onto the table. So a conveniently simple pattern. All right, any questions from going through those or ideas or something other than crickets for me? Sorry, I'm just finding it really neat to watch you work. <laughs> <laughs> So it seems to me that um, uh, there's a rather bit of an, uh, an outlay for uh, tools before you uh, can even th start thinking about a, uh, your first batch of material. There is a bit, and part of this is why we're uh, you will see a lot of money in groups work as a functional guild, um, in part because the work is hard and repetitive and RSI's uh, repetitive strange injuries are a thing, uh, but in part because if you uh, are really good at striking coins but not very good at cutting dies, um, you are more than welcome. If you are really good at cutting dies and not so good at striking them, you are very welcome in a group. If you are mediocre at everything, you are still very welcome in the group because you need someone to do everything in small pieces. So not everyone needs to have a full set of letter punches. You just need to be able to borrow your friends. Not everyone needs a bolster. We're not striking coins every day. But if one person in five, and you can gather together in a non-plague ridden world, um, five people can go through and strike a royal pound probably in an afternoon. So strike somewhere around, uh, uh, well, it's 400 some grand coins. So somewhere around 200 uh, penny sized coins. Uh, no problem, five people would do that and nobody would probably hurt the next day. Um, so there are advantages in working together. If you are working from home, uh, the cost initially, as Dietrich said, a wooden bolster works with the metal bug in the bottom, a metal disc in the bottom, uh, a little bit of drill rod, a file, uh, a hammer. Um, I started initially with a two and a half pound hammer uh, and I can now uh, swing the four pound one relatively well. Um, but you know, a hammer might set you back $30, $40, maybe less if you can score one at a thrift uh, store. And then the metals are, I think the blanks are about, like the dyes are about 10 or 12 a piece ish. Canadian. Yeah, I got a bunch and, of, uh, and, yeah, but a bunch of it. And I think it's like, you know, and it was like way more than I needed for just one uh, set of dyes. That I think that was about 25 bucks. And then for the blank material, if you're getting, uh, well, that obviously getting stuff from the Ring Lord is particularly cheap. Um, at a good starting place, but uh, if you want to make something that's got a little bit more of a proper heft to it, um, you can get a, a pound of 95.5 tin antimony solder from uh, Home Depot for about 25 bucks as well. And that's, you know, that, that <laughs> a literal pound of material is plenty to play with. Yeah. So there, it, yeah, there is a capital cost investment, but it's not huge. And I do encourage people to share where they can. Um, as I say, no, no one money or typically is using any of this all the time. Um, and uh, communal tools are a very good thing and a very period thing. Are there any things that people uh, are concerned about being able to acquire on their own that we haven't sort of covered where you can access or, or acquire these goods um, or if there's regional challenges with this? Um, I think we're mostly looking local people, but we've got a few from Out Kingdom, I think. 
Yeah, I've got the advantage of living mere blocks away from Dietrich, and you're the next city over, so. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah no is... farther than an event away. Right. Yeah, and there are, there's a metal supermarket in Kitchener as well. Although apparently the, uh, the, 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 the people at your metal supermarket or like cut things way neater than mine do. Yeah, and I, I hear tell that uh, down near Jeff, the uh, Joffer's place, the, they'll face the dies for you. Um, in the States all the time, they're like, oh yeah, I just asked them to, to clean up the faces for me. So if you know someone with a metal lathe uh, and a willingness uh, or a fondness for you, ask them to do the work for you. Um, uh, because yes, heavens yes, we do not have a crew of apprentices working for us, so um, know how to do it by hand, and then find the way to do it so you can make more art and do less of the grind. I mean, it's important to have done the grind once, in my opinion, so you know yes. what it is. Afterwards, <laughs> you can, I highly recommend any and all labor-saving. <laughs> yeah. Be, be safe, but try to work smarter uh, and not harder, uh, unless the harder is going to, you know, get you somewhere. Sometimes doing the really hard things, you learn a lot of really good things in making punches. I have learned a lot of things in making punches, um, and uh, that's a lot of trial and error, um, but it's not, you know, taxing on my body. It's just time consuming. Um, so are we hoping to be able to do uh, um, tokens for events or, or something for our reigns in the kingdom or what's the plan for our guild? Uh, absolutely, there are plans for these. Uh, as per guild, I think we can sort of dive into that at the moot, which should be happening in a half hour. Um, I know that there are plans in the work. There were plans in the works for doing uh, coins for this reign, at least in a limited sense, and then I will be honest, I got buried under a different sort of work, namely homeschooling a tiny human, uh, mm -hmm. instead of being able to have a whole bunch of shop timing, um, because we were supposed to be working on dyes that we would have been striking for uh, their royal majesties uh, at this current school. So that has not happened yet, and all designing sort of went on pause. Uh, I suspect it will resume uh, once we are free to join together as a guild again and smash a whole lot of coins. I'll be able to have a die ready and a design approved from the Royal Majesty. I hope they uh, record the moot because I've got a class at the same time. Uh, uh, all all, all full classes are being recorded. Yeah. And, though, and uh, by turning on your video and voice, uh, you are uh, essentially authorizing uh, mm -hmm. yourself to be recorded. Okay, thank you. No. And these will be posted on the full website once, you know, there, there, you know, there may be some editing involved for technical issues or, you know, you know sc screaming children. Orla right. disappears three times from the class. Um, <laughs> 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 that will be in the notes, yes. Yeah, Maybe bad. edit that out a little. This morning's class. I don't know, there could have been some great discussion I missed while I was gone and cursing my technology. Well, uh, uh, Larmer was certainly encouraging us to simply go and liberate coins. <laughs> hey, I think I've managed to get through all my classes without having to be required to be bleeped later. So I think I'm doing all right. <laughs> um, I am a delicate feminine flower. <laughs> uh, I see some things in the chat, but I haven't really been... Uh, Joey. <laughs> Never mind. I'm closing the chat again. <laughs> like, what's in the chat? Never mind. Uh, yes, uh, I, I will just say, if I can steal for a second, since we were talking yeah. about the guild, uh, I, yes. you know, even if you are not presently a member of the guild, uh, the, the AGM is open to everyone. And by AGM, you mean meeting? Yes. A yeah. AGM traditionally meeting the annual general meeting. <laughs> what? What is this business thing you speak of? I have no idea. I only art. <laughs> As I recall, during the disconnect times, there was a question about the guild. So sell us on yeah. it. 
Well, it's okay. So the uh, like I said, the the guild uh, is our uh, is a collection of moneyers in Eldemare. Um We do actually have a, a somewhat formal, uh, you know, ranking structure, uh, which we'll discuss in more detail during the actual uh, guild, uh, guild meeting. Um, but it is absolutely, as Orla said, a way of uh, not only encouraging people to learn the tools, techniques, etc., of moneying, but be able to spread that labor around, uh, and the and the the cost of the tools deferring around to multiple people. Um, so we've done, we have taught uh, a couple of classes where people have made punches and dies and struck coins and made blanks and all that all that good stuff at Fool. Um, yeah, so it's uh, yeah. The one thing I will say about this whole money thing. Because uh, I, <laughs> I got into it because I was uh, I purchased coins from Master Emric uh, in the East Kingdom, and uh, I wanted to do coins for my White Wolf Fion. And then about two months later, Orla rechallenged the Fion to make coins, which ordinarily would have been a pisser, except it was incredibly useful. Because uh, I remember our first phone call, and uh, I and Orla asked me what tools I had. I'm like, I have a hammer and a stump. <laughs> <laughs> right but it is it is something if, if this sounds interesting to you i can guarantee as someone who doesn't really have a metal working background like i've made some armor with edward um but uh it is a an art and a science that i always felt i was making progress on i never felt there was a point where i was spinning my wheels not able to progress Right, so and that's and that is really the, the main function of the guild is being able to get people you know to have access to it's like you know we've done a lot of the some of the the capital and legwork for you so you can get started and because once you get started it's a lot easier to continue mm -hmm. okay. and and having it accessible uh and meaning you can start where you are with what you know and i'm a strong believer in transferable skills and working forward from there so whatever you can do uh, we are happy to make use of your efforts while you're learning all the other things or while you're learning which things appeal to you um, and uh, going forward from there. Have you seen a picture or an image of a, of, of a medieval coin where the, um, they actually forgot to reverse the letters or something like that? I have. I actually was talking with um, Adnar Erhard about this the other day, on the Sinrith of Mercia coin. So uh, Her Grace Rylan has two Ys in her name, and Y was not commonly found on European coins around that time, so it's been around a thousand um, for Rylan and uh, Sir Edward. But there was one, and it was Sinrith, and the Y is backwards. And I assumed a moneyer had done that accidentally. I don't know much about scribal arts. Turns out that that was how the Y was typically written in a number of different uh, Roman uh, hands. So it looks backwards uh, to me, but I was told that is actually how it might have commonly been written. Um, are there legends that are blundered and almost unreadable? Oh, yes. Uh, in the medieval times, there are lots that are like that. I suspect there are backwards letters. Um, I can't think of any offhand, but I'm sure they are. Because there are many legends where they are intentionally unreadable, uh, and some that they are just unreadable through degradation over time. Uh, sorry, uh, the degradation happens in the striking process. Uh, I'm not talking about the I can't read it because a thousand years have passed problem. Oh, like the door, the die gets worn down, worn down, yeah. and so the strikes get fainter and fainter. Yeah. yeah. Yes, there are. There were absolutely coins that were made to look like those guys have coins that are taken at face value in a quality of silver that is very much respected, um, and ours are less so. So if we make them look a lot like there, and then around the edge it says, muscle, 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 muscle. Uh, we're not being dishonest. Because uh, you have to remember that literacy uh, was 
are not as common as the day. Well, we're coming to the tail end, so please bombard me with any questions on topic, off topic. Uh, we've got about 10 more minutes before we'll break so that us moneyers can have a brief break before beginning the MOOC. Where's your workshop in the first place? St. Thomas, oh, uh, in okay. the sunny southern shire of Trinovancia Nova. Um, so I'm just a little bit south of London, Ontario. I was about to flippantly answer that. It's like, it's in the basement. I, I, my first, I've been in too many classes, my first response was, well, it's down in the basement of my house, and it's back to half the basement of my house. I have taken over. <laughs> no, that's not happening. Um, yeah. I was so. going to say I did. I didn't know if it was a if if it was a house or a warehouse. Or... <laughs> uh, yes, this is my humble domicile, and it's lovely, it's, and it's what we got. It's only a uh, warehouse in the light of the full moon. <laughs> a room, <laughs> <laughs> werewolves, of London. Um, <laughs> right. I, do yeah, like... I think we've gotten silly. Just shaking my head at that one. I do you like your little <laughs> workshop? I'm only working on mine slowly. I do, um, because without it, I can't do all that I have. Uh, what I wish most uh, for a dream workshop is natural daylight. I have uh, four windows in the entire basement, only two on my half of the basement, and that entire uh, expanse of glazing is about three square feet. Um, so daylight is the thing I am lacking. I now live under the slightly hazy glow of LED uh, lights in fluorescent fixtures, LED tube lights have improved my shop lighting considerably um, from the old fluorescent tubing, but it is still, uh, I go down to the dungeon to work. It's nice and cool in the summer. Uh, it's about 16 degrees in the winter now, so that's left it. Well, it's easier to add heat than it is to uh, cool a hot space. It is, and we had a flood two years ago, so I got to, into, uh, when everything was removed and put into a shipping container, uh, and nothing, uh, we survived the flood without any significant or sentimental losses, uh, but it was a great upheaval, but it meant I was able to go and uh, re-insulate the walls in a way that wasn't draping insulation over a mishmash of studs, and so I re-inset all the insulation between the studs, uh, re-vapor barrier or and it is now much warmer in the winter. I used to not be able to work in the shop in February. You're down to about 12 degrees, and I can't sit in that for numerous hours without getting cranky. Not, not to mention when, when your shop is cold, and when, and especially when you're working with uh, um, metal, it makes the metal measurably harder to to work with. Um, yeah, yeah it, I mean. My problems were always the human problem. Um, I don't like being cold, and cold hands don't work as well as they should. And yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. But no, I I, uh, I get a lot done down here. My problem is usually uh, project shifting, uh, because there are only so many areas I can work from. So if I have to shift uh, tasks. And everything has to be cleaned, set away, and started onto the different tasks. So I do not multitask well in the studio. My fiber arts and my metal arts do not get on well. And only one or the other can be out at any given time. I feel that. I kept putting my uh, chainmail rings in the same box as my crochet. And uh, oh no, it no. didn't go so well. Oh no, I, I now found a little cotton bag, and all the chainmail goes in the cotton bag. Yup. Uh, if you were yes. here for the early shop tour, I am a big fan of the shoebox size clear plastic totes. Uh, they let me sort materials uh, fairly effectively, and I can always see them at a glance uh, if by chance they get put away in a place where they shouldn't be. See, that's smart. I should, I should get some of those too. It, it took a yeah, while uh, to get to that working smart and not hard. Yeah, I, I've heard of string mail, but that's ridiculous. <laughs> Just, you know, casually like, whoa, 
I did consider um, there's a method of um, weaving your crochet into scale mail so that the, the crochet is on the inside and the scales are on the outside. And I have a big sheet of aluminum now, so like, yeah. who knows what's going to happen to my armor? <laughs> I love your picturing of me jingling around <laughs> in like, yep. pretty crocheted colors and like, aluminum. Get a few It'll be great. I re yeah, we need more nice belly dancing. That's all I'm saying. Um, it could be fun. Here, my armor has been sitting in a bag for months now. I should probably air it. <laughs> I'm finally making mine. My leather dye came in. Woo! It's ah, yes, so it's exciting. Open. Are you finding it's working well? Oh, the dye itself, yeah. yeah. I'm going to be doing some of the dye um, soon because I just got puck board for free uh, yeah, at an eighth of an inch, which is the perfect... Uh, thickness for making the gauntlets I wanted. So, ah, nice. Woo. Not That's exactly nice. metalworking stuff, though. But it's I am tea weeny lady. I am a tea weeny lady compared to Thord the Great. <laughs> I need more lightweight materials. So you can run out of reach. I yes. highly recommend. Um, no, no, clearly, you just pulled your shield over your head, ducked down, hit him in the legs, and then you're the same mm. size. No, well, that's close, yes. Yeah. I am not that small. <laughs> I am a wide lady as well. I am short and wide. <laughs> there is more of me to hit, sadly. He is tall and long <laughs> and skinny. Doesn't work. He's terrible, yeah. I'm sure I have oh, no yeah. idea what you mean. Cough, cough, Sir Edward, cough, cough. <laughs> that too. <laughs> I, I, I am a great great fan of um, uh, apprentice laborers. What my white Theon project is my rope making machine yeah. right beside me here, and uh, um, in order to make rope, you I need a minimum of two more people. Preferably more, especially if it's a long rope. And uh, it's been out for at the uh, Upper Canada Village Medieval Festival for the past two years, and Trillium for the past two years. Um, and at Upper Canada Village, I make very period medieval rope with unpaid child labor. You sound like uh, the guy who was making rope at my girl guide camp. <laughs> they were just, <laughs> just hands, it's like, here, help me do this. <laughs> hands things off. I need, I need you to do this, I need you to do this, I need you to do this. Keep your hair tied back. Next. Yep. <laughs> as, as girl guides, we just bounced along and was like, we will do what we are told. <laughs> I can do a long. thing! <laughs> Considering that the girl guides didn't let us do half as much as the boy scouts got to... You know, we were just yeah. like, oh, we get to what? I once got to go to a Boy Scout camp, and no one... Basically, they all treated us like scouts, so we could finally handle knives and go archer do archery and things like that. That, that was exciting that day. And oh. then I was like, ooh, I want to do more of this. It, it, it's really silly not to allow children to have the possibility of hurting themselves because if you if I ha if I hand you a knife I expect you to know what the sharp end is and, and, and such and be competent enough not not to hurt yourself with it but if you've never ever handled it if you've never been allowed to to handle anything sharp because it's dangerous then it's more dangerous when you end up doing it. Um, life oh, has I a little, absolutely concur. Life has a little bit of risk to it. Um, if you don't know how to ha handle that, or, or um, that, then you're more of a danger, or or you're entirely useless because you're 
you're afraid of pricking your your finger with with doing embroidery <laughs> you know. yeah thank god for my dad uh he let me take apart computers at a really young age which if anyone has done such a thing to the magical boxes that are under your task they're actually incredibly sharp inside <laughs> So you well, learn really quick about the tools and the objects and the possible electrocution. <laughs> so we are at about two fifty here. So if the one yeah. ears want their break before the moot, we should probably wrap it up. Looks I like do because I have to grab a plowman's lunch. Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you for the presentation. It was very interesting. Yes, thank you, Orla. Yes, thank you. Thank you for your patience, all, and uh, for thank being you. here. Thank you. Bye.